is the uh, meeting of the New York State Real Estate Board, November 17, 2015. Um, I would start with Albany. We'll do roll call in Albany. We'll go to New York City, to Buffalo, and once that's done, um, we'll get started. So I'll start in Albany. Uh, Keith Simon, Department of State. Donna Zoller, Department of State. Jody Delallo, Department of State. Mark Mastrobuno, Department of State. Dan Hartman, uh, Amy Pennsylvania, Department of State. Sharon Charlotte, Department of State. Carol Fansler, Department of State. New York City. Diane Ramirez, uh, Governor. Eileen Spinola. David Mossberg, Department of State. Arnita Gann, Department of State. Joe Burko, uh, Governor appointed. Sandra Erickson. Buffalo. David Dworkin. Ron Schwartz, Department of State. Tom Cusick, uh, Cusick Center. All right, give me um, just one second. I want to kind of follow up and see if we have a quorum or not. So, um, no. No. I don't have one. I'm confirmation that they can do. Yeah, yeah. Mark said, thank you so much. You were very. I don't know if people are running late. All right, so at the moment, at the moment, it does not appear that we have a quorum. So um, I'm not sure if there's still. Um, I don't think we're expecting anybody else in Buffalo, but I think we are expecting a few more people in New York City. Um, I know Correct. Sandra had called earlier and was having trouble getting in, but she oh. made it. But you know, maybe we have a couple of more people that are um, still trying to get in. So um, until we possibly have a quorum, we will. Um, I, I would say we'll hold off on the approval of the draft summary. Um, we also have some other business down the road that we'd like to hopefully take care of. But um, so let's start with um, the enforcement update. Ernita? Um, yes. Good morning. Um, I brought with you uh, two uh, items to share. One is a consent order, and the other is a hearing determination. Um, the um, consent order involved um, a real estate associate broker um, who was showing property um, and he was actually um, charged with... Um, could could you move the microphone a little closer, please? We're having trouble hearing you up here. I, I think you have to move. Maybe you can move up here. What do you look Should you turn it up? Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's attached to the table, so um, we're no, just we going to have her come closer. Right, so I'll, I'll just move up here. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Oh, that's much better. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Um, okay, well, I, I uh, will say again, I, I just brought to, um, with you, with me, um, two um, items to share. One is a consent order, and the other is a hearing determination. Um, I, I'll start with the consent order. Um, the Department of State investigated a uh, complaint that was filed um, whereby a um, real estate associate broker um, was involved with showing property, and um, during the, the showing, he was making disparaging marks against his client. Um, in front of other brokers. So that information got back to his client um, and she, therefore they, she filed a complaint um, against the broker. Um, he was charged with um, violating his fiduciary responsibilities to um, his client and um, there was, um, he entered into a, a consent order with the Department of State where um, he was um, issued a um, fine, and um, I believe he did fine and, and settled in the consent order. Okay, we, um, the hearing complaint involves a real estate broker who um, 
was attempted to um, sell, um, deal with a client where the, the client would, he enticed the client to um, purchase, um, invest in, in the purchase of property. Um, the client paid him $40,000, gave him $40,000 to make this in, um, um, investment, and he never made the investment, and he never returned the client's monies. Um, he, um, somewhere along the line, he made an agreement to, um, um, after it was discovered that the property, was, there was no purchase on the property, he attempted to, um, he drew up agreement to um, pay the client back in installments, um, of which all of the installment checks bounced, and they were dishonored by the bank. Um, he um, ultimately never made the refund. So um, after the c completion of the investigation, um, the respondent was license was revoked, and he was ordered also to make restitution, of which I don't know if restitution has been made at this point. Um, I, I didn't share the names of the respondents, but um, um, all of our decisions are on our website. If and one want to review or look at either consent order or hearing determination. Um, that concludes my report. Thank you, Anita. Okay. Um, so we have uh, some action items on the agenda. Um, the Education Committee um, dealing with the broker curriculum, Sandra. Well, we are, uh, the committee is uh, ready to ask for a vote from the board, but without a quorum, I think we'll have to hold off <coughs> on that one. Yes. Yep, let's wait a little bit and see if somebody else comes. Okay, how many more do we need to have? Uh, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. Actually, Dave? Yeah. Um, so as acting... For the Secretary of State, I don't, I don't remember. On this board, am I a voting member? Uh, I don't actually know. Um, if you give me a couple of minutes, I could go get a law book and find out. I was, yeah, I was kind of trying to check real quick on my, my phone. Of course, I could probably use a better set of eyeballs. Um, <laughs> so I, I do know that on this board, it's... It's a majority of those appointed as compared to, um, you know, I know a lot of our other boards, it's a majority of the actual number of members, whether they're appointed or not. So I think we have 12, we have 12 appointed plus the acting superintendent of financial services and the secretary of state. So. Um, we need seven now. So if we have twelve, if, if I'm a if I'm a voting member, that would give us um, I think a quorum. And if not, and it's just of the twelve people that are appointed, then what if it's exactly half? We have six. We need the majority of it would have to be seven. regardless yeah. of vacancies or anything like that. So if the board or a full quorum of the board constitutes 14 or 12 or whatever the number is, it's a simple majority of that number. All right. What is majority? 60%? Six. Well, we need seven. You need one more. Maybe one more. There's four people, including the acting superintendent and the secretary of state. One's vacant. But like I said, I mean, I can see on my small phone that you know, the, the law for the real estate does say that the majority currently serving on the board is required in order to pass. So we would need probably, well, there's, so there's, there's 14. So we need, we need, at a minimum, we need eight. So one, two, three, four, five. Well, we're six. So we have six. If you count me, if I'm counted, then that's seven. We still need one more. So in order for him to count, that would mean the other positions would also count as well, which would increase the number of the board, right. which would subsequently increase the amount that they would need for the board. So 
either way, we need one more because if we don't count myself and the acting financial, um, the acting superintendent of financial yeah. services, should we? Have, I mean, they couldn't. She can't vote by now. This makes the third row. Trisha. Dale came in late. Dale came in late last month. Very late. Should we? To, uh, let's 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 move on with the uh, agenda. We'll we'll hold it to the side. Sandra, did yes. you want to discuss the uh, anything about the broker curriculum, or or, or, or or are we actually at the point where we'd like to make some motions? We vote? are. It's been discussed. Okay. Uh, we were we were that we were looking maybe for a vote at the last meeting, but we felt right. that we hadn't heard back from many of the committee members, and uh, not committee members, the board members, and. Uh, we have since put it out there. There's been a few minor changes, thanks to uh, to NISAR came up with a few things and she someone else. Did you come up with something? I had yeah. communicated it yeah. to Mark. Right. Okay. So yeah, we're we're ready to go. We're very happy with the document and uh, we're ready to uh, take a vote. Okay. So since we can't do that at the moment, let's uh, move on to the agenda. Hopefully, we can. Uh, circle back to it if somebody comes in. Um, so the next thing up is some regulation um, update. So um, there were several outstanding regs um, that were voted on and approved at various times within the last year. Unfortunately, I think one of them was actually uh, even longer than that. Um, what I recently did was consolidated all of the different rules that we had been working on into one revised rulemaking package. And so that consolidated rulemaking package, which covers the rule regarding escrow, um, indicating that there's a specific time frame when they have to be deposit, uh, the rule regarding uh, brokers collection or acceptance of commissions from their client as opposed to all the clients, uh, the one hour safety training course, the switch from the three hour module to allow for a one hour module, um, recalculating the amount of hours uh, to mean 50 minutes versus one hour, as well as a revision to uh, the advertising rule uh, relating to business cards that the actual title has to be listed on that. Uh, so um, I recently resubmitted all of those different rulemaking packages into one uh, package, and so that is now in the regulatory process. As soon as we get approval, uh, we'll be able to file it as a notice of proposed in the register. Um, so that's the update on those ranks. Questions from anybody? Okay. And the approval you need is just from this board? No, or we already have you? your approval. You, this oh. is something that the board has already voted. Right, on. right. But who do you need approval from? Uh, there. So the first part of the process is it gets sent over to the executive chamber uh, where they'll approve it and then it goes through uh, something called DOB review, RRU. They review it to make sure that um, it's technically correct. So if like there's a subdivision change, it's correctly numbered and things are formatted correctly, that, that sort of technical aspect review. So once those two groups approve it, then we can publish it in the register. And then there's just a two week lag from filing. Okay, I just wasn't sure if it had to go back to the legislature. Or not. Okay, fine, thank you. Any other questions for Dave? Okay. Um, Dave, I guess you're up next also having to do with the online distance learning solicitation. Right. Um, so at the last meeting, there was a question regarding a solicitation from what appeared to be an online approved school. A question was raised whether or not uh, the prohibition relating to affiliations with brokers applies to online schools. Um, and you know, after reviewing the issue and looking at the state register all the way back to 1979, before it was actually the state register, um, you know, the review that we did determined that uh, the prohibition would apply. Uh, doesn't there doesn't appear to be an actual difference between an online school versus the brick and mortar. Um, so based on information that we had received regarding that online solicitation at the last meeting, we had actually referred the matter over to our investigations unit. And so um, 
we'll look into the matter to see if there is any particular misconduct or an actual violation of our regs. But because we're now looking into the matter, I don't believe it's actually appropriate to actually get into the specifics of it, other than to say that the rule would apply both to online and brick and mortar. Do we have any questions for Dave on this topic? All right, so the next section on the agenda is new business. Obviously nothing listed. Anybody have any new business they'd like to bring forward? I'd just like to ask if, again, at some point I'd love an opportunity, if it's possible, to have Rochester be a place where I could sit for a meeting so that if there is any public comment, we can at least expose it. I know you were going to research if there is a polycom video process out there for us. I just want to put that out there again. I don't know if we've actually had the opportunity to check that, but we will. We definitely have. Thank you. Diane Ramirez in New York. First, I want to compliment that I checked with my licensing administrators, and they indicated that the issuing of licenses is happening faster. So we tend to bring in negative news. I just wanted to bring in some positive news from that aspect, and I thank you for that. And then I have two questions. Are you considering a better mechanism for firms to report concerns about agents rather than just going through the general public complaint form? Often we see something in our own organization we may terminate because of it, but I think some issues should be an easier mechanism for reporting issues we see about agents. That's a question. And then I have one last one. Have you integrated databases with continuing education schools so agents don't have to be saving the original on that, which often many of them do misplace? So two questions. Okay. Well, the first question is what type of mechanism would you like to file for complaints or concerns that you have against agents? I think just something that's more specific to the industry versus the general public, which is what we have been told is the only forum to file a complaint. So something that's just more direct for the industry. Do you mean like a more specific complaint form that is real estate related as opposed to a general form that we use for all of our 30 disciplines? Yes. Yes, that's what I'm referring to. I mean, I guess we could look into it. It would just, I don't know, it would just, it's just another form that we'd have to produce and to maintain. But I guess we would need to know what kind of information that you would want on there that's not currently on our existing form. Okay. All right. You know, if you could give us more specifics of what you're looking for. Okay. Okay. And who would I send that to? You can send it to either me or Carol. Okay. I mean, it depends on me. Okay. I have a question though. So what type of, I mean, information, so, you know, you've dealt with a salesperson that's in your employ, terminated them for an issue. I mean, is it still, I mean, are we talking some type of violation that, I mean, our enforcement should handle anyways? Or, I mean, so what, to what end are you trying to get to by having a, you know, a different avenue to report? Yeah. When you see behavior that you, you clearly cannot have them at your firm, but, but then they go to another firm and, and no one ever calls you to say, I'm interviewing an agent that was with you. So, you know, it's, 
and the mechanism for reporting with general public just um, just doesn't seem appropriate. But I, I will get you info, you know, some specific information of, of what um, what information that could be on that form that's not on the general. So I could be more specific with you. Uh, excuse me. I'm happy to announce we have one more member here. We're trying to get. Oh, to fabulous! Fabulous. We're trying. The two text and <laughs> well, we just put everything else aside. So you got me. Um, I will be more specific for you. Thank you. Uh, can you just announce? I mean, we took roll call earlier, so just let me announce yourself as a board member. Uh, David Rumsey from Rochester. Thank you, David. Okay. You. So, so I, I will make that announcement now that we do have a quorum. So we'll circle back. We'll circle back in a little bit to take care of a couple of things, but um, at this point, um, let's get through the new business section, and we'll we'll circle back after that. Um, Amy, uh, there was another question. Right? Yeah, the second question was regarding getting the uh, schooling tied into the database, and that yes. is that is a um, a plan for the department. Um, we you know we are moving, we do have a system that's e licensing that we uh, implemented for appearance enhancement where we're, we've tied the schools into the system and the, the future or the plan for the future is to incorporate the real estate schools into an online system. We're just not there yet, but it is okay. the plan for the future. That's terrific news. Thank you. What do you think the timing for that is? That's a whole other question. <laughs> okay. I mean, honestly, you know, we're pushing to move forward, but we have 30 disciplines, and we have um, other disciplines that are have much more antiquated systems than the system that we have for real estate. So I don't know that it'll be on the top of the list, but it is something that we are planning for. So. Great. Okay. Terrific news. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other um, new business? So if I don't hear any, you know, any additional new business, let's circle back now. So um, the subcommittee and department reports normally um, something we do right at the beginning, but, but um, we do have a draft summary out there. Can have a motion to accept them? So all at once. Daniel, okay. Uh, second. I'll second it. Sandra. Sandra. Um, okay. All, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So the meeting summary um, from the August 26th meeting. Okay. David, um, been in, Buff in Buffalo. <laughs> um, we um, had talked about the, Sandra had talked about the uh, broker curriculum out there a couple of times there were some small changes made to it um everybody's now had it so um we'd like to vote on it so if i can have a motion to approve the uh broker curriculum uh one 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 question just briefly going through it again you know there's so many changes that are thrown at people um that uh sometimes sometimes things get by them but um uh, Mark, on page 27, the last thing, chapter 11, local issues and concerns. Um, I believe that there was just verbiage put there as a sample um, because local issues and concerns can be certainly very different than what is here on page 27. So if you just want to mark it as a sample, and I think that that was part of the discussion. Um, because it could be anything in that, what's happening in that area that could be, um, you know, it, it could be a, a new incentive that is offered in Rochester that's not offered downstate. And so I don't want anybody confused thinking that this is what they have to talk about. Okay? Yeah, um, I agree. That is something that. Um Concerns for different areas can be applied for and approved for the curriculum. So um, we certainly can add sample and yeah, it just that, that those agreement. three bullets are samples. Okay. 
So with, you know, with that change, that being noted, I have a motion to approve? Motion. Motion to approve. Thank you, Sandra. A second? I'll Daniel? Second. second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. Thank you very much. The motion to approve the broker curriculum uh, is passed. And Yay. we will move on. Job well done. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I want to thank every, everybody for their hard work. Thank you very much. Okay. Public comment period. I have my name next to it, but I don't really have any additional comments myself. So um, I will open the floor. I'll start in Albany. We do have some uh, members of the public here. Um, I don't know if we do in New York. I can't tell if somebody is off to the side or somebody is sitting at the table. So let's start with Albany. We'll go to... Um, New York City will go to Buffalo after that. So, Albany, if anybody's interested? No? no. Really? Okay. <laughs> New York City. Oh, I'm Jane Toss, Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors, and I just want to know how long it will take to implement the broker's curriculum uh, and hand it over to us so we can start using it. Did you hear her? Yes. So, okay. I mean, that's a process. Probably, you know, it's similar to what he referred to before on the um, the regulations he had um, talked about a little earlier. But if Dave, can you just run through that again? So normally, what happens is um, with the regulatory process, after the board has voted to approve a change, uh, we prepare a regulatory package. Um, there are some documents that would have to go along with it, sort of explaining the impact on the licensees and the public. There are other uh, regulatory requirements we have to follow. Uh, we'll submit it to the executive chamber. Once they approve it, it goes to DOBRRU for sort of the technical review. And then once they approve it, um, we'll be able to publish it in the register. Um, and fortunately, that, does, that process does take you know, some time. Um, but once the approvals are in, uh, then it actually goes very quickly. When you say quickly, you mean three months, six months, so 18 months? Once, once the approvals are in, uh, we can file almost immediately. Mm -hmm. There's a two-week lag from filing to publishing. And then once it's published, there's a statutory, or there's usually a statutory 45-day comment period. Once that expires, then you, you assess the public comments, and then you can refile to actually make it a permanent change. And then there's another two-week lag. So there's a two-week lag on either end, at least 45 days in the middle, and that all um, is pending or pends the approval from executive chamber and the DOBR. That's the process that usually takes a little so longer. Worst case scenario, how long did that take for? How, if, it, if this just went through without any objection, what do you do? I'm just thinking of textbooks and getting our instructors prepared. Um, that's really they need training. Yeah, I mean, that's really something I hate to speculate on because it, it really sort of changes. Um, some regs could go through that review process very quickly. Uh, it sort of really, to some degree, depends on the urgency of the rule. Um, so there's really no way of guaranteeing, and I would really hate to speculate. I think this is an important point that's brought up because um, we certainly want whatever changes are made, we want them introduced statewide. And uh, it is very important to get the uh, book publishers, the textbook publishers, and the online publishers um, uh, to make sure that they too are ready. Um, so I assume that the department will, um, once that everything is approved, will decide an appropriate amount of time because certainly the day that it's, it's, it's approved shouldn't be the effective date. <coughs> um, I think that so that everybody has time to rearrange their programs, train their instructors. And um, in all honesty, I think we're very dependent on the, um, uh, the textbook companies and the online providers, particularly since so many students take their courses online, that, that we don't put an onerous time frame on those online companies that, that they don't get it right. You know what I'm saying? So do, do you d determine the effective date, or should we discuss an effective date? 
Um, Dave, can we, um, when you put it through the regulatory process, can we determine an effective date that we can implement it as of? Yeah. Um, so generally, you, you can either have it effective on the date of publishing. So what would happen, as I said, there's a 45-day comment period. And so, uh, you know, in this type of incident, probably 45 days isn't enough to say, you know, 45 days from now, this is when it applies. So in the um, filing documents, you, you can put anything. You could put a date certain. Mm -hmm. So you can say, you know, on you know, 11, 11, 2016, this is when it comes into effect. Or you could do something like 120 days after this rule is published in the register. Uh, we really do have that discretion to make whatever is best Fine. for the industry. Yeah, because I know a lot of publishers and online people wait for it to be actually approved before they invest the time and the energy to do something that might lead to change. Yeah, I mean, that's something that we sort of account for when we make these types of rule changes. Um, you know, depending on what the industry needs, it's probably fair to say probably, like, you know, certainly not effective on the date of publishing, but something more like on either a date certain to give everybody enough time, or just say, like, after 120 days after it's published, that's when the rule takes effect. So yeah, we'll definitely take that into consideration when we get um, to the to the point where where we are um, we feel is going to be approved. We'll you know, look into that, reach out to um, the book and the you know, people um, who developed the courses and the, and the uh, uh, book publishers or whatever to to make them aware of it, come up with a time frame because. In addition, we have to update our exams also, which, you know, we put it into, um, you know, we put it out there and then we give it a certain time frame and then we update our exam so that we kind of get both people who uh, have taken the old curriculum and then the ones taking the new curriculum so that, so there is some, some things that we will work out as a department as to the date, the date, the time frame. Well, Amy, I know if you're on top of it, it will get done. Right. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you. <laughs> Dave, can I just ask you a question? So when you submit this for approval, do you have to have that language in at that time to say, like, we want it to be 120 days after approved or 180 days? Uh, do we have to kind of discuss what we might need for lead time before that can be or can that be added once the comment period is done? In theory, it could be added during or after the comment period, ideally for this type of a change, uh, I would assume that we would be able to have, you know, that knowledge before we file so that we can do it in the, you know, first filing because revisions are actually a little bit more uh, challenging to deal with. So it would, be, you know, my opinion would be that we would want to have a best guess, put it in the original filing and then use that as sort of a target date to get you know everybody on board with the changes. Amy, we want to solicit a little comment from people on the board. Mike, well, I think that we should reach out to the publishers and the online. You know, they are the ones that really know how long it will take to do it. So um, while Dave is getting it prepared, we can reach out, do some contact, and then maybe come up with a, a, a plan, and then at the next point, just present it. Make sure everybody's in agreement with it as David is getting his part to get it filed with the governor's office or whatever. Dave, do you think this you'll have this ready before a, a, another board meeting or probably have it ready like at the next board meeting and we can discuss it then? I mean, do we have to kind of send something out ahead of time? I, I'm just looking worried about timing, Amy, about whether we should you know reach out and do all that and maybe reach out to the board members and just kind of say, look, we checked with. Uh, book publishers, some of the online schools, they're saying this. Anybody have an objection or whatever? Because I, I mean, does the board members have any, uh, have any time frames that they're looking for, or are you just interested to make sure that the, the books and the online courses are um, are available at the same time the curriculum uh, will be adopted? Well, I mean, you, you, the online courses, okay, are reading. The student reads it, so right. it has to be redone, and right. they have to redo their 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 technical end. They have to redo their tests for the units. Um, uh, 
most teachers teach from the textbook. Um, so I think it's crucial. I, I think, Amy, as you said, you'll reach out and you'll determine a very good, uh, a good time to, yeah. to implement this. But, you know, if I was to give my best guest estimate, uh, I, I think you're going to need any, you're probably going to need a four, a four to six month window here. Right. Because you have to redo an exam. Absolutely. And we'll need to get our, um, the courses into us also. Right. You know, because we need the new, the new exams approved by the school. So there is a, there is a process involved, but um, our first step will be to reach out to the industry, you know, now that we have it approved, we can start doing that right away. I mean, one of the other things that I could do is, I'm sure this wouldn't be the first time I've ever made a change, so I can always look back at the history to see what was given the last time there was sort of a substantive change. You know, if last time there was a substantive change, it was a six-month window, you know, probably be a safe bet that you'd want six months on this go-around. So that's, I think, certainly easy to find out. Yeah, we have more, you know, just... And, uh, Probably not my topic exactly, but we probably have more things that are online and things like that than we have in the past, and that does involve, like Eileen said, I mean, they have to change, you know, their whole multiple parts of it to get it ready to be given online. So, yeah, but we'll, we should definitely look into it and see if we can come up with some, you know, consensus. We probably should err on the consensus side to make sure that it is doable both on well, the book publisher's end, the school's end, and on our end, you know, as... You know, Amy had mentioned we have exams to redo as well, so we all have to be ready at the same time. Okay. Um, Buffalo, any public comment? Tom? Uh, yes, I have, a, I have a comment about a question. I just want to thank Amy, who, when I brought this up previously, she communicated um, directly to me about uh, the distribution of hours or points for the brokers qualifications to be um, have that experience to get them their broker or associate brokers license and and I'm asking the question now because I'm not clear on what the regs say but it is my understanding that if I list the property and it sells I get 60 points or hours if I'm the selling licensee, I get 250 points or hours. Is that your understanding of the rates? I don't have I don't have the point schedule in front of me, but I know there's a difference as to whether you're the listing or the selling agent and how many points you do get. So whatever is okay, listed so on the application. Ten, ten to list, two fifty for the selling. Agent. Yeah, 10, 10 to list, 250 if you're the selling agent. Okay, so let's... I'm sorry, we couldn't hear that, Amy. What did you just say? 10, 10. to list, 250 for the selling agent. Okay, thanks. So that, this means that if a person was a lister, in order to qualify for a broker's license, they would have to get 58 transactions. And a person who is selling the real estate that's listed by the listing salesperson would only have to do 14. There seems to be a discrepancy there and not a recognition on the service that the listing salesperson provides to the transaction. Either we, I'm recommending or asking that we either split those if we're so concerned about the total number of points we're giving that the listing salesperson or the listing licensee is it as important in that negotiation as the selling licensee? And to minimize their impact by a, a substantial reduction in the number of credits or points seems to me to be not punitive, but a failure on our part to recognize the importance of the listing salesperson. So does that require an action of the, the board? Does it require a uh, posting of it? I think that, that, that those points were um, done at um, a subcommittee of the board at one point when the um, points were being changed. So there was some thought behind the points that were established. If the board feels that that needs to be um, re-looked at, 
then I think that it needs to be brought before one of the subcommittees, maybe the trust committee or, or, or one of the committees yeah, and make that determination whether yes. it needs to be reallocated. But I know that when the points are um, were initially distributed, it was discussed with a panel of people who, who, who talked it out, you know. So if the board wants to reconsider it, then I think that the members need to determine whether to ask what they want to bring it before a, a subcommittee. Does, that, does the board members all agree to that? No, no. No, someone was an agent. Yes, you did. New York City, do you have a comment on that? We're discussing it now. <laughs> yes. Should we ask? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Dan. Well, we had some question regarding the listing agent. Is it a listing of an open listing or end, or is there a difference in points if you list an exclusive property? Because that does entail a great deal more. Uh, information and responsibility on the part of the listing agent, but but an open listing may not be as as uh, complicated. You can take any listing. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. just taking information. Um, Tom, did you have a concern for those two things, or you're still more of just a listing and a uh, it's different? I uh, I agree. I agree with the fact that you have. That if it's an open listing, uh, it doesn't require the same same uh, uh, input. But when you're preparing that seller to be part of the meeting of the minds, that's as much a part of the negotiation as when you bring the buyer who's willing to meet the mind of the seller. I uh, it just. It, it, it doesn't seem to recognize the importance of an exclusive agency and an exclusive right to sell. It just doesn't, it doesn't give it uh, equal weight. And I just think that the marketplace is, is reflecting that it is of equal importance. That's I, my I take on it. But. I agree with you if it's an exclusive listing. But if it's an open listing, that means there could be any number of other, other agencies that have the listing. So you're not specifically preparing the seller for uh, the the actual selling of the property, but with an exclusive, you clearly are. I think that has equal weight, in my opinion, to the selling agent. An exclusive listing agent and a selling agent, to me, should be much closer to being equal weight. But I'd like to carve out open listing uh, listing agents. To me, that that would be less of a point structure for that. Am I speaking for I, the group? I, uh, okay. I, I don't necessarily. I agree with partially what, what okay. you said. I think that we have to look at the relationship that's being created between the seller, his broker, and if there's a third party broker, the one who brings the buyer. Right. So if the relationship is an agreement that was designed as an exclusive, it's great. If there was no agreement in writing, but still a relationship exists, and that particular broker is doing the work on behalf of the seller, it should be accounted as the same. I don't think that there should be such disparity between, regardless, between a selling broker and a buying broker. I think they're both equally important to the transactions. I've never been to a transaction where a selling side is saying, I'm not negotiating. There's always an element of negotiation. There's always issues. There's always items that needs to be addressed. There's never a situation where one side is just says, here's the address. They can happen. Really, it never really happens. Mm -hmm. So so I think that so long as you have both sides of the transaction, both broker, I believe, are equally important, um, rather regardless of the fact that if it might be an exclusive or not. Now, I deal with situations that we may not have an exclusive but we have a relationship to bring a, a property to the market. Um, and we work very heavily with an owner. It can be over a course of over a year sometimes in, in my world. Um, it, it should not exclude a broker that works on behalf of an owner if it just so happens that an outside broker ended up you know, uh, bringing a buyer. So, so in my view, I think 
a 50-50 in, in the split of the responsibility of broker, both, both brokers, uh, seems to be adequate. But your example sounds as if you, you have consummated a transaction. Of course. I'm thinking of an open listing where you're, I'm assuming you're getting credit if you just... Just list and just the property list never sells. And not and sell it. Okay. That's, so that's the oh, scenario that's I'm talking oh, okay. about. Yes. You could easily ha uh, come up with 58 of those. Yeah. And, can you I, know, can and I interrupt for a minute? Yes. Right. So there, the point schedule does, I mean, it does differentiate in exclusive listings and open listings and does recognize that the exclusive listing, you know, gets more points. but. I don't know that that was exactly what Tom's comment was about. I think it was more about the, even the 10. So it's open listings get one point, exclusive listings get 10. But I think Tom's comment was that the 10 is very Still too low. Oh, too low compared to the other thing. It so, is. Absolutely. I mean, so, agree. Yeah. We agree. Okay. We agree. So, so I think maybe we should assign the topic to a subcommittee. Now, I'm not exactly sure which yeah. subcommittee. Um, looking at them, it looks like trends. Yeah. Okay, so um, on that committee, I had uh, Dave Moss, Perko, uh, Sandra Erickson, David Leno, uh, Duncan McKenzie, and Diane Ramirez. So um, maybe we can um, assign that topic to that subcommittee and ask them to look into it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. good yeah. idea. Perfect. Okay. So we'll put that down as a, I guess, as an action item. Okay. Excuse me, would any change, would any change to these, uh, this point structure, would does that require any legislative? Uh, it requires rule changes. It does. Regulatory. 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 Yeah. Just quickly, and it's just a point of information, um, looking at the action items, uh, did we get any kind of idea about requiring a high school diploma or GED before becoming a licensed salesperson or as a requirement to become a licensed salesperson? Um, we, we have it in the minutes. We did look into that, Eileen, and um, our first step was to look at how we treat it, you know, with our other plans. Um, and historically, it's always been that we only require it when it's a statutory requirement. And there is no statutory requirement to require a high school diploma or a GED. And if we try to implement it, um, there could be um, a challenge to it because it's not statute. And that's where our other disciplines do um, have that requirement set forth specifically in statute. So it would take legislative action. Someone would have to submit to the legislature that that be changed. Right. I mean, that's what we're going by based on, you know, historically mm -hmm. looking at all of our other disciplines and which ones require diploma, which ones we don't require diploma. And, and our other ones specifically stated out in statute that a high school diploma is required. Okay. Thank you. Well, maybe you can comment during publicly. Um, so I think that probably concludes the public. Um, so do I have a now? So before I get to the next to, to getting motions for adjournment, um, just want to remind everybody that we also right after we adjourn the actual board meeting, we kind of call into session um, the public hearing. So if everybody would just remember that we're going to go into that. Generally, that doesn't take a great deal of time, but I don't want everybody to get up and, uh, and leave. So do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. You second. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Okay, so the meeting is officially adjourned. Um, we'd like to hold the uh, public hearing session now. Dave, can you run that through? Sure. Um, so as... Um, you know, we just mentioned that the regular open meeting is closed. Uh, we're required uh, to hold uh, public hearing sessions, um, and so this is the opportunity for public comments or anyone to um, bring anything to the department or the board uh, that they would like to bring. Um, so I guess that, you know, what we've been doing is starting in Buffalo, Albany, and New York, so uh, 
I guess I'll do the same thing. Anyone in Buffalo have any uh, thing that they'd like to mention? Oh. Uh, yeah. uh, excuse, um, oh, more comments. I, I'm sorry about this, uh, but uh, on a previous at a previous meeting, I asked the board if they would consider reducing some of the hours in the 75-hour course and redistributing them. And I think it was in the June meeting, uh, not the August meeting, that I asked. And I thought it was tabled or sent to the Education Committee. I don't want to change the hours, 75, but asking if, in fact, we could take some of the hours from the commercial and investment real estate, give it to valuation and listing procedures, and uh, some to license law. In teaching the license law section, I find it extremely difficult to cover all of the license law and the rules and regulations in a three-hour segment. And I think that that's critical for the licensee to understand that part of the law, to protect the public. So I'm, I'm asking that again, but if the board says no, I'm okay, go on. I think it was determined that we were going to um, bring it before the uh, the education subcommittee once they were done with the broker curriculum. So now that the broker curriculum is done with, that could be the next topic to look at. One okay. more thing, if I, one more thing, if I could. In a previous meeting, Eileen Spinola's comment about having critical thinkers as licensees and wanting to have them have a high school diploma. And, and I think that that's fantastic. If we can't get the changed in the law and get a lot of blowback, I think, and Keith may disagree with me on this, I think we can achieve some critical thinking in our licensees by increasing the difficulty of the test that they have to take which would mean that we ferret out people aren't critical thinkers by making it difficult for them to pass that test. Well, I, just I, want to, I just want to comment on that. Um, uh, uh, realizing uh, that life has baggage, uh, I suggested a high school diploma or a GED. Uh, and I think that that's important. That gives anybody whose life experience uh, possibly derailed them from getting a high school diploma, but they have shown that they uh, have the desire and the and the and the and the the skill to achieve a recognition of learning. Uh, that we don't lose sight of a GED, but that does then ensure the public of the barest minimum of uh, academic uh, achievement, which I think when you're dealing in such high numbers and uh, such a, a, a volatile um, uh, process, that the public does deserve that protection. And I, if I so I'll make a comment, maybe I, but I'm making it anyways. Um, you know, the state exam, first of all, shouldn't be a tool. You shouldn't use it as a tool to just exclude people unnecessarily. I mean, it does determine who's competent, who's not competent. That is our only level that we shoot for. Success is a whole different story. But I will tell you, everybody doesn't pass the state exam. The state exam has a passing rate of probably just over 60% for the salesperson exam. But I will say, it appears almost everybody passes school. So I think there's almost some discrepancy on they get through school, but they can't pass the test. So, you know, I think there's a disconnect there somewhere. I mean, and I'm not throwing, you know, aspersions on, on anybody, but it seems everybody always gets through school. They don't always pass the state test. So I don't think we need to lower the passing rate on the state test to, you know, exclude other people. I think we are definitely excluding the um, folks that we don't want doing it. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I think that you're absolutely correct, um, and and it, it, it comes back to you know the the school tests that are submitted to you. 
that a school does um, submit when they ask for uh, approval to run the courses. But um, I, I do think that you know times change, uh, methodology changes, uh, you know paradigm shifts occur, and we're in an age now that memorization is the basic and when we are dealing in an industry that requires so much analytical analytical I'll say it again competency I think that that we should all look at uh, the textbooks we should look at the exams and a good portion not a good portion but a certainly a section of that should involve critical thinking and not just memorization of rules and regs because analytics it has been the biggest paradigm shift of the last 10 years in real estate and we have to look within and say are we preparing our agents for the industry at hand to service the consumer. Can I make a suggestion since the commi education committee is already in the mode of uh, uh, reviewing the hour distribution, maybe Tom, you can uh, put forth some suggestions, send them to the committee and we can have a conference call and see. Uh, see where we should go with it because I like the idea I think the brokers course is excellent now and it's more up-to-date and more time you know with the times and everything and I think probably it'd be a good idea what do, what do you think Mark uh, great idea um, uh, everyone get in touch with me we'll come up with a date and we'll discuss it yeah and Tom's always I mean I we, I've known Tom for a long time so I'm sure he's more than willing to um, lend his knowledge and, and comments to that, I'm sure. Am I correct, mm -hmm. Tom? I don't want to speak for you. Ab absolutely, Keith. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you I, will. I will do it. I will do it. Okay. Are you part you're part of the subcommittee now? I uh, guess. Yes. Now you are. If you weren't, you are. <laughs> um hey, so I know I made my comment before, but I don't want you to think it's just real estate. We have a lot of disciplines a lot of schooling and it, it goes that way all the time and I recognize that the school is a whole different thing I know you have paying people and you know during any kind of course whether it's real estate cosmetology nail specialty um, any of the other ones that we deal with or even just regular school that I've been to and everybody else has you know at some point you prepare for the final exams obviously with the state exam we're not here to prepare people that's not our you know, purpose. So certainly, it's more difficult there. But you know, it, it does. So I'm not, I'm not down the schools that everybody passes. I recognize that the differences there, and they're different. You know, they're prepared differently for it. But I mean, the state test does kind of exclude people. Definitely. Okay. Anybody else for the public hearing? Want to wrap it up, Dave? Uh, the yeah, there's nobody in Buff uh, Albany, right? Who has any comments or wants to add anything? No comments at Albany. All right. And New York? All right. Not nothing. <laughs> Not nothing. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this concludes the public hearing session of the.